All right, so just to give you a couple more examples of isomers here, notice that these two compounds are not isomers, and hopefully you can see why. We only have two carbons in this right-hand structure, but we have four carbons in, in this left-hand structure here, and so the molecular formulas actually differ. So those two molecules are actually two different compounds entirely. Not that isomers aren't different compounds, but those are definitely not isomers. On the other hand, if you take a look at the two structures on the bottom now, we've added two carbons to this right-hand molecule. And so what you can see is that these are indeed isomers. They both have the same molecular formula, so they both have four carbons and ten hydrogens. Notice there's a hydrogen here. But they differ in their connectivity, so whereas a methyl group is connected to the second carbon in this right-hand molecule, we see that, in a sense, there's a methyl group connected to one of the terminal carbons in this right-hand molecule. So we've essentially swapped a hydrogen and a methyl group in these two molecules. So they're definitely isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but differ in their connectivity. One important point to note is that isomerism is a relation, not a property. So it's a it's a relationship between two molecules, and so it makes no sense to say this molecule is an isomer in and of itself. One molecule is always an isomer of another molecule. And we'll see that again and again for all kinds of, of isomers. So pretty much every, or the most important new terms that will be introduced this chapter are different kinds of isomers, particularly stereoisomers or spatial isomers. And what you should keep in mind is that it's always a relation and not a property. So it's always a relation between two objects and not a property of one individual object. So just to give you a little teaser, it makes no sense to say that a molecule is an enantiomer or is a diastereomer. What you should say instead is a molecule is a diastereomer of another molecule or a mo molecule is an enantiomer of another molecule. So that brings me to really getting to the heart of how organic chemists think of molecules in spatial terms. And really, the ultimate fundamental criterion of identity for organic molecules is if they are superimposable. If we can take one molecule and superimpose it on another, considering conformational changes even, or considering translations or rotations of the molecules, then those two molecules represent one compound. So take, you know, the example of butane, for instance, that we just saw. So this is one way to draw butane in one conformation. We can also draw butane this way in a slightly different conformation. But keep in mind that single bonds of organic molecules are free to rotate. So we could simply rotate around this central bond here, and that would convert this structure into that one. And we might have to do some rotation of the molecule, maybe around this way. But then we could superimpose that resulting molecule directly onto the other structure. And so that tells you that those two molecules are strictly identical. Two molecules that cannot be superimposed are not the same. And this is very important. We're going to see a lot of examples of molecules that originally chemists thought were the same, but as more details came to light about organic structure and about the nature of molecules in three dimensions, chemists learned that superposition is actually harder to achieve in some cases than, than we might think. I say here they may be isomeric because they may have completely different molecular formulas, in which case we're not dealing with isomers at all, right? It's that most general property of being uh, two molecules that have the same molecular formula that is sort of the starting point for isomers. Alright, so now let's start talking about stereoisomers. Stereoisomers, whoops. Stereoisomers are two molecules that have the same formula and connectivity and still are not superimposable. That's the definition of stereoisomer. So 
Take, for example, imagine we could freeze in space these two molecules, the butane molecules that I showed you before. If we could freeze this space, and this, uh, this conformation, and that rotation, and all the single bond rotations were frozen out, then what we would see is that we would actually observe two different compounds for each of these conformational isomers of butane. So even though at room temperature, rotation around that single bond is fast, if we froze out those conformations, of course, simply moving one of those molecules on top of the other, we would not be able to superimpose them because we would see one methyl group would not overlap with the other methyl group on that compound, and so they would not be superimposable. So this is sort of a very basic example of stereoisomers, two compounds with the exact same connectivity. Notice that carbon is connected to carbon, connected to carbon is connected to carbon. We have all sp3 carbons and the rest hydrogen, so the connectivity is all the same. The difference is the shape of the molecules and the fact that they cannot be superimposed. And we would expect different behavior out of these compounds. Again, assuming that conformational change is frozen out, we would expect different NMR spectra, perhaps different um, melting and boiling points, you know, different physical real properties out of those molecules. And I highlight for you at the bottom here what really what makes the difference. It's the interatomic distances between the unbonded atoms. So if you look at these two examples uh, up here of the two conformational isomers of butane, what you can see is that the distance between the two methyl carbons or the two end carbons is much smaller for this sort of isomer where we have the two methyls on the same side and it's much larger for the isomer with the two methyls sort of pointing away from each other. And that provides a hint that these two molecules are different chemically, right? Because we would expect the methyl groups to influence each other in some way. It may be very, very subtle or very slight, but we would expect this methyl group to have some effect on the reactivity of this methyl group. And clearly, it can exert its influence much more strongly when it's closer to the other methyl group than when it's farther away. So we would expect different behavior out of these two different frozen-out conformations of butane.